Tommy didn't put me in a bad position. I would have to talk, talk to you in 15 minutes, everything that has happened in, during the two days. <laughs> and, and very nice presentations, very, very lovely two days. And I've learned, learned a lot. My basic background is a physiotherapist, and I've been a physiotherapy teacher for almost 20 years. So I look at these issues from that point of view. I'm sorry if I have violent, violent um, way of, of handling your presentations, but I, I try to seek the things that are um, most, most, at least most, most of the, that that I understood. Okay, there were four workshops and um, uh, physical trainability and fitness testing with transplanted patients or subjects and. and we started with Professor Heikki Tikkanen and, and, and maybe the main thing that, that struck us is that nothing happens by alone. So we should remember the whole picture. We have the muscle, we have the heart and blood, we have the lungs, they work in conjunction and, and, and we should be able to monitor all of them from time to time. Uh, perhaps too many measurements are taken while rest resting and then trying to explain something while, while it's ha happening when we are doing exercises. So nowadays we do have very good measurement devices and systems, so maybe we could use more of that as well. Then he explained that he has two questions that he always asks from his subject or patients or clients. Heikki Tikkanen question, so how was it? And the first question was that, do you exercise regularly? And people often tend to say, yes, I do. And the next question reveals everything. So when was the last time that you were exercising? And if people cannot answer to that question, then probably the question number one is, is not so, so, so correct. Uh, yeah, we were uh, hearing, hearing that, that, that how, how, and, and you all know how tough the training is, and, and it takes time. But once you stop training, it, it, the results and the muscle and, and all, all the capacity declines very quickly. And you must know that our, our patients and our clients are there on, on the bottom, depending, of course, what they have done previously and how long they have been waiting for their transplantation. But, but it's, it's a long way to climb up from, from there, and that's always should be remembered. Okay, then Catherine Rulli uh, was wondering what kind of exercise would be superior, and she introduced us to this high-intensity interval training, which can be done in many ways, and this is one way of, of doing it. And uh, it's, it's it has been proved, proved to be quite effective, but the answer for her question was that we don't know. And, and, and there are many ways to, to exercise, and we don't know exactly what would be the best way. But for, especially for heart transplantation subject, this high intensity interval training has been proved quite efficient uh, way. Then she talked about motivation, motivational is issues which are very important and, and those issues came up in, in very many other workshops as well, but in a different, different way. And, and then we talked about a little bit about are there any meta-analyses for these heart transplant subjects and, and the, the answer was no. And one reason for that was just because there are not too many uh, good researches available to do a meta-analysis. So, so we really do need to research more to know what the exercise would be superior. Uh, the questions got harder and harder. The question was which one first, the chicken or the egg? And <laughs> for that one, we didn't get the answer yet. Uh, there was two examples from, from, uh, uh, from Edwin and, and from Andre and, and the, the Edwin was telling us how it was to climb on, on Mount Kilimanjaro after transplantations, and, and it was a lifetime experience. 
with the long-term effect. So it was really, really, really interesting to hear. And for Mr. Andre Lassoy, he, he is on the picture, he has been climbing and he has been diving with the lung transplanted and, and, and really fascinating to hear what his, his story and what he is capable of doing still after a after long period of, of heart transplantations. Professor Novitsky uh, told us nice facts about hydration and sodium balance and, and, and especially with the long distance or high intensity exercise. And we were discussing that whether these transplant patients should drink water from the bottle, even in Finland, although we have a pure water in here, but maybe if you are, if you are um, drinking normally bottled water, maybe it's better than also to drink bottled water. That was one, one thing that struck my mind. But he was talking about nicely about the hydration and, and the problematic with that one. Pinya, Pinya told us her story about how she has recovered from her liver transplantation and, and how she has gained uh, lots of lots of medals and, and, and she is currently, if I recall correctly, shifting from 100 to 800 meters, and, and which is more suitable for him. We already heard some of some of Professor Höcke's uh, presentations today. Um, he said that this is the most important slide in here, so I had to take, take this one, <laughs> even though I, it's not my, my uh, personal uh, ability to understand all of it. But the, the, if I understood the message is that take your medicine, too little rejection, too much side effects. So it's always the balance, dif difficult to have the balance. But the thing that I liked most was this last one when we were discussing this, uh, Physical activity is helpful and in even sport is, is possible. I, I really like that because none of, uh, not all of those people who will get transplant, plantation will be maybe okay, able to sports, uh, be involved in sports and maybe they are not even interested to be in, in sports. For those who, who will be and, and are, that's okay, but, but I, I, I really, can share this, this, this idea that it's, it's not necessarily possible for everyone. And, and as we heard today, that, that then coaching or establishing a football team would, could be a nice challenge as, as well. Uh, then we heard Kasper, Kasper's nice presentation and we were wondering how little hours does he spend on training for the last three, four, no, the, for the last three, four months, this, oh, yeah. this, this training program, yeah. Oh, it was only like 11 or 12 hours per... Nine to 12 hours. Nine to 12 hours per week for Ironman trainings, which is not much in, in, a, in, a, in a normal Finnish standard as well, <laughs> I would say. But, but everything you do is, 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 is you concentrate and it's well, well done. And, and no resting day except the Saturday was, was it so that you know, it's a swimming day, yeah. sort of resting day, but that was, <laughs> that was something that we, we were wondering, that no, no resting days. And interesting this way of you doing these training zones that you have, you colored them in different ways. Uh, the white zone was the, the, the easiest one and the, the black zone was the, the, the hardest one. And that's how you, you sort of, uh, uh, the intensity was, was uh, was it on your calendar, the intensity in that way, or how, how you use this? Yeah, for every, uh, every training session I had, I had uh, you can see from the schedule, there's uh, how much time in the, each uh, training zone. So I always knew what zone I was training in, how, uh, how the intensity should be. So I, I could almost uh, just not think about it and just do it. And because it was so intense, my training, uh, it was also almost only uh, interval training, um, which was the most important to 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 train uh, uh, the shape and uh, then the long distance in the weekend to get the distance training as yeah. well. Yeah. But altogether, this project took about two years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
very, very interesting story. Um, then we had a third workshop, and, and the, the title for that was the, from the passive patients to active participant. And Kwok was talking about the, the, the ICF and the physical literacy, a little bit introduced about this, not just the ICF, but ICD-10 and will be ICD-11 within two years or so, ICHI also, and, and this, this idea. Um, I took a few slides for those of you who don't so much know about this ICF, International Classification of Functioning, uh, Disability and Health. Uh, this is the normal situation when people are talking about the functionality or uh, the professionals. They are talking about the same thing, but not the same, same words. And, and, and this often makes, makes it very, very difficult. So what ICF can provide you is, is, is it's a, it's a uh, framework that can organize this whole information. So people, when they are talking about functioning, uh, and, and disabilities and health maybe, they have the same languages and they ha understand the same way. And how we have used it, this in, in our school, for instance, is that we know how to, where to place different, for instance, not measurements or different instances when we are measuring like muscle or, or something, muscle strength or something like that, we put it over here and, and then we don't forget these activities and, and, and participation where the participation normally takes the environment with, but all, of course we have these environmental factors and per personal factors. I found one um, article that it's, this ICF has been used, and it's been used in cardiovascular, uh, cardiopulmonary conditions, and, and interestingly it says that the con conclusion, although exercise seems to be most needed rehabilitation function for kidney transplant patients, other transplant patients will require considerable more rehabilitation interventions. They compared the, what kind of ex, uh, uh, rehabilitation interventions they, they got and, and put that on, on a function scale and, and that's how the conclusion came up. But it's coming more and more popular, this ICF, and I, I really like, like the idea that we share the common language for this. Um, then Professor Roberto Cacciole talked to us about the kidney transplantation rates, things related to that, and, and, and as he mentioned that we of course hope that all the donors are in good shape and, and young, but it's not often the case. And, 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 and also he talked about the, the, that the patients are our ambassadors and, and the financial focuses and financial discussion is always important in this context. Then we heard Phoebe Pace. Phoebe is a six-year-old girl, lovely girl, lovely story, and, and, and she shared her stor story, and, and I guess the Friends for Life was the main, main idea. So she had found lots of, lots of good friends and she's very active and, and participating in, in many, many different uh, games and, 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 and camps and, and so on. And Liz talked about uh, the, how to encourage people or young people with organ transplants and, and they have founded this Tackers, which is a non-profit organization that arranges different kind of um, camps for children of, from eight years to 15 years and one of the things that Lee said that, that the social media is very important, how people keep contact and, and so on. Then my slide, uh, just to remind you that the physical activity and exercise is not the same. Actually, if you are, you are, you are car um, careful, exercise is sort of a, a subcategory for physical activity. And this is often for, forgotten that exercise is exercise, it takes certain time, but physical activity is, I'm phys physically active, and you are physically active at the moment, but is that enough for the, 
for the healthy life, that's another issue. But exercise is different, and we, I talked a little bit about this point of view. And then Professor Malkia talked about many things, but maybe this one, just to remind you that really there are, in, in, a, in a week there are 164, uh, 168 hours, and, and in a day there are 24 hours, and it's divided in, in many different ways, and, and, and it's, it's the sleeping time is, is about 30 percent, but the, the, the training time or rehabilitation time only takes about two to five percent of total physical activity. So, how much is that? If, if the, let's say 98 percent is something else, so how important that really is? If we don't know the other one, so like he said that we really have to know. If we want to change something, we really must know what to change. So if we are only talking about one hour, like let's say one hour exercise or something like that, then what is the rest 23 hours per, per day? In, interesting idea. And if you add uh, also, if you add this exercise, one hour exercise per week, it's away from something else. So we don't have 24, 25 hours, we have 24 hours. So when we are doing exercise, we are not doing something else that we would be doing at this at that time and how comparable that really is. So that is a good question. So really this physical activity guideline is uh, available for all, all of you and it's also on, on the internet. Then we heard, then we heard nice uh, uh, presentations about this, this uh, uh, renal re rehabilitation in, in, in King's College Hospital. Ellen O'Connor talked about us motivational interviewing and, and, and about it, how, how it has changed many, many things in their, their uh, uh, hospital, in, in, in their rehabilitation center. And really this was nice, this exercise while doing dial dialysis and, and they have a specific monarch bike that has customized for, for this, this one. They have used different, right, different type of bikes, but, but this is, is this custom made for you only? Yeah, yeah. And it works well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a really, really great idea that the, the air commuter can be used in, m in multiple ways, just in, in the regu regular ways. And then, then Charlene Greenwood shared, shared actually the, the how, how, how you are doing, more specifically how you are doing your, your physio, with the, especially with the renal, renal subjects or renal transplanted subjects. Really, really nice to hear. And then finally, Sonsoles Hernanes Sanchez talked about the effects of resistant training program on fitness, muscle mass, and quality of life, and, and how she has established. I didn't find the other platform, but this one I found it, this transplant bike, but this was in Spain, and my Spanish is not so good, so I couldn't, I couldn't but I found, I found this, this platform, and, and, and she is using it, and, or they are using it for their their purposes. Okay, five more minutes to have this, how, how was it, wild ideas and practical tips. Okay, uh, this one I wanted to show, show you, first thought that I wouldn't, but I wanted to show you just to know that, and okay, these are from the epi epidemiologic studies, and as you, if you were here yesterday, we know that the epidem epidemiological studies are not so valid necessarily because they tend to look only few things and, and neglecting many, many things. But some, some ideas that, that all cause mortality, some, for some, uh, this is how many hours per week you, you need to train, and like for breast, breast cancer, we know, or colon cancers, we know, we have some, some um, knowledge that, that physical activity is helpful for, for them. But as you can see, it requires quite a lot of work and, and the all-cause mortality doesn't go that much down. Whereas, like diabetic people, they really take the advantage even from 
little less training and it's, it, it's, it's very suitable or hip, persons with the hip fracture and, and so on. Uh, my question is there are three ways of doing three hours training. One, one of the things, the dosage is very, very important. This is one practical tip, I, I guess. No one can know. The, the, the current physical activity guideline says at the moment that, that you should do the activity within 10 minutes bouts. I've been trying to look for where this 10 minute bouts come from uh, and can, could you do it in, in the less bouts. I've, I've found some three minute bouts but not less than that. But I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that you could basically do your training in, in, a, in, a, in a less or, or shorter bouts as well. But these all four pictures are, are uh, uh, three hour trainings and, and they they all consume the similar amount of energy, but we really honestly don't know is there any, is this, some, some of these ways of training the best way to train. We don't have the knowledge. Most likely this little bit higher intensity but smaller parts, maybe they are more effective than, than like one and a half hour but very low level, level intensity. But they all consume the same amount of energy. So maybe you can pick your, your choice from there. Uh, we tried uh, with our students. This is just an intervention, very, very quick intervention. What about if you take the stairs? These are met values in here. I put the, the uh, R band that Esco told yesterday. This is a one measure, way of measuring physical activity. It has proved to be quite valid and accurate. And as you can see, while sitting, it's 1.2, 1.3, depending on how active you are when you're sitting. So nothing much happens. But then you have the interval break. I advise some of the students to go to take the stairs. We were on the third floor, take the, oh, sorry, take the stairs, and few students take the, the elevator. And then compare that, are there any differences? As you can see, these people started to walk, and the walking is about three meters or so, not very, very much so they they walked to the elevator took the elevator while these two persons took that took the stairs and you can see that that while going down it all, all almost for this person the met values were for for eight and and coming up eight seven six very high but only very little time so my question is that would these kind of activities accumulate during the day into the health properties? Probably, but no one has really studied this. But if you don't do any exercises, but you take stairs instead of elevator, for instance, that may be, may be one, one interesting way of doing this. This is an interesting study, just very, very quickly. There were two, um, actually three different ways of the same people were doing uh, three different things. They were sitting practically the whole day, whole day, very little activity. Only thing for this exercise group, they changed that they, they exercised for one hour. And then they changed for the last, this very minimal intensity things, but they were more active. They like stood up and, and, and didn't do much, but they were a little like active. And then they compared that, were there any differences between these? And as you can see that one hour daily physical activity exercise cannot compensate the negative effects of inactivity and so on. But take a look at our, our physical activity guidelines. They tell you to exercise uh, hour and 15 minutes intensively in a week or so on, or, or two hours, two and a half hours. What do you do with the rest of your lives? What do you do with the rest of your, your are, are you doing it like this? So you would be fulfilling all the criteria for the physical activity guidelines, or are you doing something like this? Very, very interesting. Um, intensity is very, very important. This is, shows the, the physical activity duration and, and the, the all-cause mortality, how it decreases with the exercise. If you do it more vigorously, it, it, it goes, the, 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 the risk of, of, of uh, sudden mortality or all cause mortality really decreases quite nicely or quite swiftly. All exercise is good, but, but, but if the intensity is not that high, not that much happens. 
there's a similar studies that can con confirm these kind of things. So the, it's associated with increment of total and, and inactivity. So the idea is some is good, more is better. That's a one, one way of putting, putting this. So be active. Uh, one thing for the intensity, this is an interesting thing. This was for persons who were told to, to do a very vigorous, very active 45 minutes training. And then they were, were seeing what happens on, 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 the, on the metabolic rate. And, and as you can see, the metabolic rate after this 45 minutes uh, exercise remained over 14 hours higher than a norm, normal day. So if you had a very high intensity training like in here for 45 minutes, it remained about 14 hours higher than in a normal act life. So it's not just the exercise time, but it's the post-exercise time as well that can be effective. We don't know how effective that is. We haven't been studying that. There are not that many studies about that. But that's an interesting. It's not just a one minute time. Okay. One, one thing I want, want to show you. This is one colleague of my friend of mine, Arto Hautala. They did their, their uh, training. They made people training. Uh, I'll show this one. For two weeks, very, very quite intensively, then they allowed this was the wait time for eight weeks and then they did endurance training. So they did strength training and they did endurance training. And see what happened. Some people, most people benefited very well from the training, but there are some people who don't benefit from the training. Always there are some people. So people are training very, very hard and they don't get any results. What happens? How do you motivate them? The same thing, this is a very new new uh, uh, research, but the same thing happens in here. As you can see, the change in muscle strength is not... Uh, there, are, there are some people, but especially in the muscle size, in all the, all the age groups, people are training hard, they doing their training, but they don't get any, any, any benefits. What explain? What are the known determinants behind the training? See, we address the dose response here, but the genetics seems to be the most important thing. Then the, the autonomous nervous system is, is very important. The dose response is only at currently, this is, this is only for 5%. So the genetics are really affecting on, on these things. Very briefly, why people are not active, lots of things why people are not active, my, my practical tips come here. Why don't you take the exercise regimen there where people are, like we are doing now on the shopping centers, while you go shopping, do your training there, so you don't have to go somewhere else. That's one, one thing, or taking to the school, schools as we have done, done, done like that. Uh, 5G will come soon here. The Internet of Things will really change the whole picture. And, and, and we can measure but this, while you are living, someone, clinician, and someone can and get the access to the, that one. And, and really, when we get the, this big data, this whoever, it is said that whoever will get hold of this big data, he is ruling the world in the future. So, so that's, a, that's a one thing for sure that will change. For sure. And this is my last slide. My children are already playing this Pokemon Go. So things happen very, very fast. These hover ports or aviation ports were really, no, no one knew them last year, or maybe few persons. But now when you go here on the streets, you see these avion ports. Or Pokemon Go was released on, on Australia, uh, uh, USA this week. My kids somehow got them, I don't know how but they are now playing this Pokemon Go, which is, uh, you collect these Pokemon characters on, on, on normal, normal places. You, there, there's a map and you collect these Pokemon, Pokemon characters like that. So it's activating at least my kids like that. Thank you very much.